Very good. Good evening, everyone. You are all very welcome. Um, and uh, thank you to Jeremy good for evening. setting us up and arranging things, and uh, to Diana for doing the organising. Uh, our, our topic for the evening, then, is to look at the Abrahamic faiths and to look at unity and diversity within these Abrahamic faiths. So let's first of all begin by saying, who are they? And uh, normally people talk about three Abrahamic faiths. Those are Judaism and Christianity, descended from Abraham through his wife Sarah and their son Isaac, and Islam descended from Abraham through his wife Hagar and their son Ishmael. There is of course a potential fourth Abrahamic faith because we're told that Abraham also had another wife or perhaps a concubine called Keturah and she had a series of sons from Abraham and the Baha'is trace the descent of Baha'u'llah from one of those sons of uh, Abraham and Keturah. But uh, for the sake of simplicity this evening, we will just work on the basis of the three Abrahamic faiths. And I want to talk about both unity and diversity. They are united first and foremost, a theme that we'll come back to again and again, in a faith in monotheism. So it is a belief in the one God which unites all three together. However, they are diverse in the way in which they understand their relationship with Abraham and through Abraham with God. So rather than call them the three Abrahamic faiths, I prefer to say rather more accurately, three faiths with a particular place for Abraham in their system. So let's begin with Abraham, the father of monotheism. We're told that Abraham's father, now they live down in modern day Iraq, a place called Ur. And in this place, Abraham's father was both a maker of idols and a merchant for idols. So he grows up in an idol worshipping community. And the key thing is in Genesis 11, when he is told to get up and leave his father's household, which means leaving behind the idols which his father and that community worshipped, and to go forth where God will lead. And we're told that they leave Ur and they go up to Haran. And Haran would be in modern day Syria, just uh, north of Palestine. Now, uh, there are several stories attached to this leaving behind the idols. And they come both from the Jewish sources, what's called the, the Midrash, the commentary on the scriptures in the Jewish tradition, but also they come from Islamic sources. So, uh, I want to take one story, first of all, which comes from both. And uh, we're told that um, Abraham's father goes off on a journey and leaves him to look after the shop. And while he's away, he decides that he's going to smash all the idols. And he breaks them up either with a big stick or an axe, depending on which story you look at. And then he leaves the axe alongside the biggest of the idols and when his father comes back he says what happened here and uh, Abraham replied mm, don't ask me ask the big fellow with the axe and of course his father replies no point in asking him he can't talk and so Abraham responds well what are you doing worshipping a god who can't even talk now, that story is also told in chapter 21 of the Quran. There's another tradition which is shared by both the Jewish and the Muslim tradition, and that concerns a character called Nimrod. Now, Nimrod 
um, is a certain mythical character. We don't know too much about him, but he's, he's interpreted as being uh, a king of a, a local uh, company of people around that area in the Middle East. And Nimrod is a, a great belligerent sort who commands people to worship him. And so he's a, you know, he's a sort of God man, as it were. And there's an encounter then between Nimrod and Abraham. And Nimrod says to him, worship me. And he says, no, I'm not going to worship you. Well, then he says, worship the fire. And Abraham says, well, what's the point of worshipping a fire? Because water can put out a fire. OK, says Nimrod, worship the water. Well, that's a bit stupid, says uh, Abraham, because clouds contain water. Well, then worship the clouds, says Nimrod. Well, yes, but they don't forget that the winds blow the clouds in and blow them away again. So why should we worship them? Well, worship the wind, says Nimrod. And uh, Abraham replies, but people can stand up against the wind. So at this Nimrod gets fed up with the whole thing and orders that he is thrown into a big fiery furnace. And there he sits in the middle of the fire, unscathed and thus protected by God. So this is our picture then of Abraham, the rejecter of idols, the one who worships God alone. Now, there's a, another version of that told in the Quran in, in Surah 6, in which um, Abraham is, as it were, questing for what it is he should worship. And he notices the moon and he thinks, this is it, I'll worship the moon. But then the moon sets, and so that's a waste of time. So then the sun rises, so he says, I'll worship the sun. And then the sun sets, and so that's a waste of time, and so on until ultimately he discerns that it's God only who is worthy of his worship. Now this then becomes the key to the whole story, because one who worships God alone, one who submits himself to the worship of God alone, is of course the def definition of the word Muslim. Muslim we can say in the generic sense, not the follower of Muhammad and the reader of the Quran, because that comes many um, centuries later, but one who submits and worships God alone. So therefore, Islam regards him as being a Muslim. One who worships God alone. He's also called in the Quran a Hanif. Now, a Hanif is a seeker one who is seeking knowledge about God. So technically we can call the Hanif the, the undifferentiated monotheist. There is only one God, I am in search of more knowledge about this one God. So that then is Abraham. Now uh, to summarize this belief in monotheism, because it's a, a very important topic, I want to just read a little extract from Maimonides. Now, Moses Maimonides is regarded as being the greatest systematic theologian of the Jewish tradition of the Middle Ages. Uh, born in Spain under Muslim rule, working in Arabic as well as in Hebrew, a philosopher working in the philosophy of Aristotle, so Moses Maimonides is this great philosophical theologian. And in his 13 principles of faith, the second principle, he says this. God, the cause of all, is one. The cause of all, God created everything that exists. This does not mean one as in a series, there were lots of them, but this is number one. No, nor one as a uh, nor one like a species. So the species, gods, and he's one of them. No, nor one as an object made up of many elements, lots of different things joined together into one. Not that kind of oneness. Then he goes on nor as a simple object, 
that is infinitely divisible. So God is neither composite, made up of lots of elements, nor divisible, could be divided into different parts. Rather, says Maimonides, God is a unity unlike any other possible unity. So this then stresses the uniqueness, so the oneness as in uniqueness, unlike any other possible being. So that's our fundamental principle of monotheism that binds all three communities together. Next, Abraham is called father of faith, both in the uh, book of Genesis, when he is told to leave the place where he grew up and to go to a place that God will show him. So he has no idea where he's going. He goes forth in faith, not knowing the outcome. So this then becomes the kind of archetype of faith which uh, Christians will recognize from Paul's letter to the Romans, which called Abraham the archetype of faith. And uh, Catholics might recognize that, um, that terminology from the great Eucharistic prayer of thanksgiving in which Abraham is called our father in faith. So he is the archetype of faith for all three traditions. Abraham is also called the father of many nations. Now, we have seen one line of descent through Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, that is the descent of the Hebrew people, of whom is born Moses, of whom is born Jesus, and therefore we can see that biblical line of descent running down that way. But also, the father of many nations within the Islamic tradition as well. And Genesis tells us that Abraham takes a second wife, Hagar, who bears him his firstborn son, Ishmael. And it tells us that Ishmael will become the father of a great nation that will dwell between the sea, as in the Red Sea, and the great rivers, that is the Tigris and the Euphrates. So we would know that today better as the Arabian Peninsula. And it was here then in the Arabian Peninsula that um, the descendants of Abraham and Ishmael were to live. Now, Genesis goes on to tell us that after Isaac is born, Sarah starts to put in the needle with, um, with Abraham. What do we need Hagar and Ishmael for anymore? We needed them when I couldn't have a son. Now I've had a son, chuck them out. And we're told Abraham doesn't want to do this because after all, this is his wife and his son. And it requires a, a message from God telling him to let them go. They are to go forth. Now in the biblical tradition, going forth means head off into the desert. So they head off into the desert and that's as far as the biblical tradition will take us. But the Islamic tradition then takes up the story. And we're told that Hagar and Ishmael go down into the Arabian Peninsula and ultimately end up in the place which is today Mecca. And it is in Mecca that several episodes take place. First of all, when they arrive, their water supply has run out and God miraculously supplies them with water. And so a well springs up from the ground, a spring of water, which is called the water of Zamzam, and that flows to this day in Mecca. We're told as well that Abraham used to keep contact with this part of his family. He used to come periodically on visits. On one of these visits, 
Abraham and Ishmael together build the Kaaba. Or perhaps we more accurately might say rebuild the Kaaba because it is held that this was the first building on earth built for the worship of God uh, around the place where Adam and Eve were reconciled to God when they were thrown out of the garden. So they build the Kaaba and that becomes the central focus of prayer on earth for Muslims. You will know that Muslims, when they turn toward God in prayer, they physically orientate their bodies on the Kaaba. And in so doing, they are living a reminder of their link to Abraham and Ishmael. Another story occurs a little while later, and that is the, the testing of Abraham and Ishmael. Now this story is told both in the Bible and in the Quran. The difference is that in the biblical tradition, the, the test is that Abraham is told to sacrifice his son Isaac. In the Quranic edition, there are two important differences in the story. One difference is that the son is not named. The Quran just says the son. Now there were some early Muslim commentators who said, well, that could well have been Isaac then. But the tradition comes around to focus on it being Ishmael instead. And the argument is made, Ishmael is the firstborn son. Therefore, he was the son before Isaac was born. Therefore, in the absence of a name, it's Ishmael. The second difference is actually rather more critical. You may remember, if you've been around some of the uh, art galleries of Europe, that we have this whole European scheme of the sacrifice of Isaac. And Isaac is tied up and bound, ready to be sacrificed. You remember that Abraham and Isaac have gone out to the place of sacrifice, and Isaac has said, haven't we forgotten something? Namely, a, a, a sacrificial victim. And Abraham says, they're there, just leave that to me. And when they get there, they then, he ties up Isaac, lays him on the altar, and is about to do the deed. Now, in the Quranic story, the critical difference is this, that Ishmael is told what's going to happen. Now, Ishmael is also a prophet, according to the Quran, according to Islam, and therefore he is perfectly obedient to God. So Abraham is told, go and tell Ishmael what you have been ordered to do. Now, Ishmael responds, I'm not the author of my life. It's not for me to tell God when I should be born and when I should die. If it be the will of God that I should die this day at your hand, you will find in me an obedient servant. And so it's a double test. And the two of them, knowing perfectly well what they're about, go out to the place of sacrifice. They both prostrate themselves before God in total submission. Abraham comes up to do the deed and Ishmael remains prostrate, ready for his father to kill him. Then both stories end the same way. Angel appears, no, 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 stop, test over, sacrifice the ram instead. So you can see that both faiths are very intrinsically bound around the person of Abraham. Now, if you look at all the practices that go on, on the Hajj. The Hajj is, of course, the one compulsory pilgrimage to the Kaaba in Mecca, which is obligatory for every Muslim at least once in their lifetime, provided that health and wealth permit. And all the actions associated with the Hajj are actually traced back to Abraham. 
So they run between two little hills looking for water, as Hagar did. They go around and around and around the Kaaba, singing the praises of God, as Abraham and Ishmael did. They go out and they sacrifice a ram to remember the sacrifice of Abraham and Ishmael. So the whole thing is bound together in the faith of Abraham. The Talmud, that is the, the oral tradition handed down and passed down through the generations by the learned ones of the Jewish tradition, it tells us that Abraham kept contact with his family, the family of Hagar and, and Ishmael, and Genesis 25 tells us that both sons were present at the burial of Abraham. Now, if you think about it, it's a long way from Hebron, where he died, down to Mecca. No helicopters, no mobile phones, so there couldn't have been a sudden call, come quickly, your father's dying. Ishmael was up in Hebron, along with Isaac, witnessing the death of his father and then the two of them officiating, if you like, at his burial. And in the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron, this is the place where Abraham was buried. And throughout the centuries, it has been a place of pilgrimage for both Jewish and Muslim peoples. Those Jews, who, those Muslims rather, who were coming a long distance to make the Hajj, traditionally on their way back to wherever they were going, they went to Hebron to pay their respects to Abraham. And up to this day, it is a, uh, a site of pilgrimage and veneration for both traditions. Unfortunately, in the modern time, with a dividing separator to keep the two communities apart uh, because of the politics of the modern state of Israel. So there we have Abraham, father figure of faith, the archetype of faith. Next, we see Abraham as the father of the covenant. Now, in the biblical tradition, there are three key covenants between God and a key figure within the Hebrew tradition who represents the people. The first is between God and Noah. This is after the flood, where God promises there will never be a flood again. And the sign of this covenant is to be the rainbow. So God, as it were, hangs up the bow of war. And there's the rainbow. Whenever you see the rainbow, be reminded that this will never happen again. Now, the people, the sons of Noah, are to keep seven basic commandments as part of that covenant. So God's part, there will be no more flood. The part of humanity, you are not to kill, you are to honor and respect, etc. So seven simple commandments. And these are called the commandments, the seven commandments of the sons of Noah. Now, the third covenant, of course, is that with Moses. God makes a covenant with Moses. The people are to become a beacon community upon the earth, which will act as a guide to other peoples of the earth. They will be a people who would be, as it were, a leading light of the worship of God, and therefore they are to keep the commandments of the law. Now, seven commandments for the sons of Noah, 631 commandments are contained then in the Torah, in the law which is to be kept by the Jews. We'll come back to law um, in a moment or two. Now, let's turn then to the covenant with Abraham, because there are a couple of really instructive points here. The first one is, when you seal a covenant, what you did is that you took animals, you 
cut them in half, you laid the two halves facing each other, and then the two parties walked between the severed animals. And what you were saying was, if I fail to keep this covenant, let what has happened to these animals happen to me. Now, in the covenant of the pieces, as it's called, Genesis 15, Abraham cuts the animals in two, lays the two parts facing each other, and only God passes between the two parts. So only God is um, committing himself uh, into this covenant. It is a fundamental commitment of God to Abraham and to his community. And God passes through as a, um, a bucket of fire. The next covenant is um, even more important. This is Genesis 17. And this is the covenant between God and the descendants of Abraham. Now, this covenant has certain promises by, uh, by God. That is... Uh, that you will have a relationship with me, you will have numerous descendants, and I will bring you to a land where you are to live. Now, this covenant is sealed by Abraham and by all the males of his household by their being circumcised. So Abraham circumcises himself, and all the males of his household, including Isaac and Ishmael. Therefore, contemporary Muslim boys are circumcised when they're small. It is not a Quranic injunction, but rather it is a sign of belonging to the covenant, the sunnah, the practice of Abraham. And um, that's why both Jews and Muslims, males, are circumcised. Indeed, if you are an adult male convert to Judaism, according to some schools, if you are an adult male convert to Islam, according to some schools, you need not be circumcised. Others say you must be. Those who say you need not be circumcised will say, unless you go to make the Hajj, because if you go to make the Hajj, then you must be circumcised, because that is part of the Sunnah, the practice of Abraham. Therefore, we have this um, obligatory circumcision for both communities. Now, what about the Christians then? Because they're obviously left out of this deal. One of the first things that happens after the death of Jesus in the first generation of Christians is that they have to work out if you are a non-Jewish convert to Christianity, just how much of the law, the Jewish law, are you bound to keep? Are you bound to keep the dietary requirements? And in this case, are you bound to have your boy children circumcised? And this is one of the things that is sorted out at what's called the Council of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15. And there it, the decision is made that non-Jewish converts to Christianity are not obliged to be circumcised and are not obliged to follow the dietary laws. And then you will know, Christians will remember, that this theme is then taken up by Paul in his letters, where he talks about circumcising the heart and not the foreskin. So circumcision then binds these faiths into a relationship with Abraham. Now let's just look for a moment at Abraham specifically in the Muslim tradition. Muhammad is not the only prophet that has been sent to the earth, far from it. 
he is the last and universal and definitive prophet sent with the last universal and definitive revelation, but before him there were many others. The Quran doesn't tell us how many others, but there is a tradition from Muhammad in which he speaks of 124,000 prophets. Now, the Quran does name 25 of these prophets. Abraham is one of those who is mentioned. And Abraham is one of that very select group amongst the prophets who is actually given a way of life, a code of life by which his community should live. So just as Moses is given a code of life, Jesus is given a code of life, Muhammad is given a code of life. And we're told that Abraham received a scripture from God called the Shahuf, and this was the foundation then for the way of life that they should live. Now, way of life is the translation of the word Sharia. Sharia is to establish a code of practice, a way of living that is leading people in a godly direction, leading them toward God. Therefore, Abraham has this very exalted place within the Islamic tradition. Uh, Abraham, of course, when you uh, put it into Arabic, is Ibrahim. So you will often meet Muslim males called Ibrahim after the prophet Abraham. He is, of course, as we've already seen, both a Muslim, one who submits to God alone, and also a Hanif, that is an undifferentiated monotheist. At the end of every obligatory prayer, the five liturgical prayers of the day, which Muslim men and women perform, blessings are sent not just upon Muhammad and his descendants, his family, but also upon Abraham and his family. So you can see again, Abraham binds the Muslim community into this common heritage. Now let's look at a few points of um, diversity between them. Judaism and Islam share a common paradigm, a common understanding of their relationship with God, that is that they have received a book of guidance from God, a scripture. Now, this is the book which is given then to uh, Moses, the Torah, which is given to Muhammad, the Quran. So both these communities are people of the book sent down from God, from the transcendent world to the recipient, Moses or Muhammad, and therefore that is the word of God in its most literal sense. One of the things that actually divides contemporary Judaism is the status of this Torah sent down from God. So the orthodox schools within Judaism would hold that the whole of the five books of Moses were sent down upon Moses on Mount Sinai. He received the whole law. The Reform Jews, remember Reform Judaism really grows out of Germany in the, the 18th, early 19th century. And Reform Judaism began to explore the Hebrew writing of those books, and they saw that actually they are not all from a single author, but they actually repeat and they weave things together, and you can see some elements from one period, some elements with one stress, some elements look as though they have a completely different hand who's writing them, and therefore Reform Judaism would take the position that the Torah is a 
an inspired text sent down upon Moses and the community, but that it was not um, a one-off revelation, rather that it was the weaving together of different traditions. Now you can imagine that that separates reform and the orthodox schools of Judaism rather significantly. And that's one of the things that divides those communities to the present day. What about Christianity? Of course, Christianity is the odd one out. Because although the Quran calls Christians people of the book, just like Jews, in fact, a Christian understanding is not that they have received a scripture sent down by God from on high, but rather that Jesus is himself that primary deposit of revelation as Christians would say, the revelation, the word of God written in human flesh, written in the human being of Jesus. So Jesus is the incarnate word of God, not the recipient of a scripture which has been given to him by God. So that quite a different understanding then between um, Islam and Judaism on the one hand, and Christianity on the other. Now, in contemporary Western thinking, law, as we have seen during the pandemic, is often thought about as something that constrains and stops you doing what you want to do. And so therefore, the primary question is, how do we get round it? How do you get round the law? Uh, what happens to you if you get caught? So law has become a kind of negative concept. Now in both Judaism and Islam, law is an absolutely positive concept because the law is God's gift of guidance to humankind on the way in which life should be lived. What greater gift could God give to humankind than a book of guidance? This is how your life should be lived. And so law is a very positive concept. We've seen the seven commandments of the sons of Noah um, applicable to all humankind. And we have seen the Torah given to Moses, the 631 commandments, because God had called them to be a beacon community upon the earth, to live in a certain way as a pointer, as a beacon, a guide to other people. For Islam, the Quran is the last, the definitive, the universal deposit of the perennial guidance that God has sent upon the earth. The Quran never says this is something new which has never been sent before, but it always says that it comes to confirm and to correct the earlier deposits, the earlier revelations. So we can think of it then as the last and definitive deposit of the perennial guidance that God has sent to humankind down through the centuries. From the time of Adam, to the time of Muhammad. Therefore, the law is God's blessing for all humankind. Christianity again then is the odd one out because Christianity does not have a book of law in anything like the same sense that either Judaism or Islam does. Indeed, again, Paul's phrase, we might remember, the law is written upon the human heart. Therefore, we have the primacy of conscience. I am accountable before God for the way in which I live my life. I, therefore, must hear God's command, must put it into practice. The law is written upon my heart. It is an internal thing and not an external thing. Another diversity. 
Judaism and Islam have no doctrine of original sin. Christianity does. So let's see just first of all what we mean here. Both, or rather all three traditions will say that Adam and Eve fall from grace, therefore they are sent out of the garden. They are reconciled to God, and God reconciles them perfectly, therefore they are restored to that relationship with God which they had before the fall. Christianity has a different take. It says once sin has entered into the world, you cannot then take it out again. You cannot un unsin the world. It's entered into the world. It is a flaw in the human condition. That's what Christians mean when they talk about original sin. So my way of thinking of this, if, if you think of a beautiful vase, the vase is broken and no matter how carefully you put it back together again, you cannot put it back together again without there being flaws in that vase. Those flaws, that's the flaw in the human condition which Christians came to call original sin. As far as Islam is concerned, God can restore that vase perfectly. There are no flaws, therefore there is no original sin. Now what this means then is that both in terms of Judaism and of Islam, there is nothing to stop the human being from living perfectly according to the way of God. There is nothing that I cannot put right. Every human being is capable of living a godly way of life. Therefore, there is no savior motif. There is no atonement motif within Judaism and Islam. I am capable of living a godly way of life. Therefore, I do not need somebody to save me. There is no savior motif. Christianity, of course, will say that once sin enters into the world, this fundamental flaw can only be repaired by one who is utterly without sin, that is, the perfectly obedient Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is saviour. Jesus is the one who undoes the flaw created by um, Adam and Eve and sin entering into the world. Now, Judaism and Islam have a doctrine of God, as we have seen, of absolute monotheism. End of discussion. Christianity, of course, continues the discussion at some length. That is because Christianity understands itself as being an absolutely monotheistic faith, but they understand that one God in Trinitarian form. And that then always throughout the centuries has provoked questions, uncertainties uh, between Jews and Muslims on the one hand and Christians on the other. Are you really monotheists or are you worshipping three gods? Are you tritheists? And the history of Christian, Muslim, Jewish discussion, theological discussion, has often focused around trying to understand this doctrine of the Trinity and trying to see, can we really say that Christians are real monotheists or has that been edged by their doctrine of Trinity? Or indeed, have they created false gods of their own construction? And have Christians in fact become tritheists and moved away from the doctrine of the absolute oneness of God? Now it's important to just take stock here for a moment. One of the incidents that is recounted in the Quran takes place in the year 631. 
Now, by that stage, Medina, the city of Muhammad, has really um, become the, the paramount power of the, the, the lower two thirds of the Arabian Peninsula. And all the other peoples of that area have either come under the direct leadership of Muhammad, in other words, they've become Muslims, or they've entered into pacts with Muhammad, sort of mutual defense treaties, we might say. Now, in the year 631, uh, a, a massive, uh, um, uh, a high power delegation of Christians comes from a city which would be down in modern day Yemen called Najran. And they come with princes, with bishops, they come with the whole leadership contingent in order to enter into discussion with Muhammad and to create a pact with him. And this discussion goes on for 80 verses in the Quran in chapter three. And it becomes really quite heated, quite sharp, because the Quran and Muhammad are saying to them, listen guys, you have misunderstood the nature and the person of Jesus. You have divinized Jesus when he was a prophet sent by God of the highest order of human beings, but only a human being. Now, during this discussion, the Christians say, well, excuse us for a little while, it's time for us to pray, and we should uh, go outside Medina somewhere and find a quiet place in the desert where we can pray. And Muhammad's response then is very indicative. He says to them, oh no, you don't. If it's time for you to pray, you pray right here in Medina in my mosque. We're meeting in the mosque, you pray here in the mosque too. Now, if there'd been any thought in Muhammad's mind, even though they had been challenged that, you know, you've misunderstood the person of Jesus, but if there had been any thought that these were idol worshippers and not monotheists, then I suggest he wouldn't have allowed them to offer their Christian prayers in his mosque in Medina. So it's quite an important issue to talk through and think about the monotheism of Christianity, how that can be explained and discussed and talked about, and the issues that that brings then, in, especially into Christian-Muslim relations, and has done all the way down through the centuries. Just a few more points of diversity. Judaism understands itself to be a community in a particular relationship with God, particular in the sense that they have got a particular function in the world given to them by God, not particular in an exclusive sense of saying God is our God and nobody else's. God is the one God, the only God that there is, but nevertheless, a particular relationship, a particular function in the world, in the Jewish tradition. Now here, both Islam and Christianity take a different position because both Islam and Christianity are saying there are no specials within the sight of God. The message of God is for all humankind. All humankind are called to follow the way of God, the way to God, the way of being in this universal relationship with God. Therefore, both Islam and Christianity regard themselves as being universal faiths and not just of a particular people. Another particularity that the Christian tradition has is that it has an institution which it calls church. Church is not just the gathering together of the people, but the leaders of that body have a particular responsibility as being teachers of the community, bearers of the message 
of Jesus in the world, therefore they are called in a special way to bind themselves into this body called church. Now both Islam and Judaism understand this rather differently. There isn't an equivalent body to church. There isn't an authoritative teaching body in that sense. What there is, is the scholarship of the wise and learned. So both within Judaism, in the person of the rabbis, and within Islam, in the person of the outstanding scholars, the ulama, as we say, they have a responsibility to be guides, to be teachers, to be scholars within the community, but they do not have that hierarchical structure that um, Christianity has developed. So anybody who thinks that they can go and unearth the, the Jewish or the Muslim Pope or the Synod or the Council or the gathering of bishops or patriarchs or whatever it might be, I'm afraid has got a long journey uh, to nothingness because such a body does not exist. Leadership rests with the scholars and scholarship is open to any man or woman who equips themselves to do the job and demonstrates that they can do the job. Following on from that, Christianity has developed a double doctrine of priesthood. On the one hand, this authoritative body of the church calls certain people for a particular function within the community as what are often called members of the ordained ministry as priests or whatever name you want to call them, whose responsibility it is to uh, perform, to be in charge of the sacraments within the community. In this sense of the meaning of priesthood, both Judaism and Islam have no equivalent. There is no priesthood in this sense within Judaism or in Islam. There is, however, a second sense of the term priesthood within the Christian tradition, which is often called by the theologians, the priesthood of all believers. That is, every single member of the community of the church has that responsibility of standing in a unique personal relationship with God and collectively exercising that within the community. Now, in this sense, Judaism and Islam have a lot more similarity with the Christian tradition. There is no sacramental priesthood then so that um, within uh, Islam and Judaism, the Imam who leads the prayers, the Maulana, the Alim, whoever, does not have any special powers conferred on him that would be the equivalent of the ordination within a Christian tradition. Anybody can be asked to lead the prayers provided that they have sufficient knowledge and their way of life is sufficiently pious that other people will agree to pray behind them. So there is no priesthood in this sense. In the Jewish tradition, the great place of remembrance isn't actually in the synagogue, it's actually within the family home. So it is the dining table around which the family gathers where all the major festivals are celebrated from the weekly Sabbath all the way through the uh, liturgical year. And it is the, the head of the household in traditional Judaism, the man, the father, sometimes the oldest man present, who acts as it were as the, the leader, the conductor of the worship. I always remind myself, uh, when I worked for a number of years in Birmingham, we had there a very 
beautiful synagogue. It was the first purpose-built synagogue to be built um, uh, after the return of the Jews um, uh, in the 17th century. And it was up for sale. It was up for sale because there were two Orthodox synagogues and there weren't enough Orthodox Jews to keep them both going. You need to have 10 men for any formal service and they simply couldn't muster the numbers necessarily every time. And I remember I was very close with the, the senior rabbi there and I said to him, Leonard, it must break your heart to leave this beautiful building behind and to think of selling it. And his answer was very clear. We, the Jews of Europe, he said, have hundreds of years experience of leaving behind beautiful buildings. It wasn't beautiful synagogues that kept the faith alive in Europe during centuries of persecution. It was the dining table. It was the dining table where the faith was taught, where the community celebrated and cherished each other, and where the festivals were celebrated. So in this sense, then, we can see that the dining table becomes, in a sense, the meeting place between the individual, the family, the community, and God. Now, this is crucial because um, none of these three religions say the purpose of the human being is to be religious. Instead, they say, the purpose of the human being is to live a fully human life. A fully human life under the guidance of God, but to be fully human means to be in this relationship with God and with one another. That integrated spirituality then is profoundly to be seen in Judaism, in Islam and in Christianity as well. Now I want to conclude by just going back to our friend Moses Maimonides for a moment, because the absolutely central binding point between the three Abrahamic faiths is this principle of the oneness of God, of monotheism. And so Maimonides again gives us a couple of nice little sentences. He says, God is one, and none beside God is to be worshipped. So all must be taught that God is incorporeal, without a body, that there is no similarity in any way whatsoever between God and God's creatures, that God's existence is not like the existence of creatures. God is not a creature. God's life is not like that of any living being. God's wisdom is not like the wisdom of the wisest human beings. And that the difference between God and creatures is not merely quantitative. God is more knowledgeable, God is whatever, better than us, but is absolute. There is an absolute difference between the two. Therefore, Maimonides concludes, God is one, unique, indivisible, eternal, creator, sustainer, all good, all knowing, all powerful, all true, the source of morality, the judge, the unknowable, the revealer, and the utterly transcendent. And so far, all three of our faiths would concur. But then the odd man out yet again is Christianity, which of course has an understanding of incarnation. That is that God is incarnate in the person of Jesus. And therefore we have a unique imminence as well as an absolute transcendence. And at that, I shall hand back to Jeremy, who's going to work marvels with questions. <laughs>